So I thought since we have such a, a highly qualified uh, panel this morning and, and such a diverse panel, since we not only have the PR professional, but we also have the you know, best-selling author and, and you know, highly regarded journalist who can give us his perspective on how he manages his relationships with the PR professionals, I thought it'd be important if we could begin by defining some terms. For instance, what is a reputation, good or bad? and how do PR professionals and journalists influence perceptions of brands in times of crises? So I don't, who, who am I picking on first? <laughs> Steve. Oh, gosh. Okay. So the question is, what is a reputation, pretty much? Right, and how do... Well, you know, I think a reputation can be different depending on who, um, you know, I, I think we all have reputations. Everybody out there does. Um, you know, and just like in life in general, some people are fans of yours and some people are not fans of yours. And your job is basically, um, you know, for your clients or whoever you're, you're representing to make sure that as many people as possible um, have a favorable, you know, a favorable thought and a favorable impression of you, your clients, whoever, and uh, you try and minimize the negative. Right, and reputation is perception, right? Mm -hmm. right. So what people perceive, and I always say perception is reality. Um, because so it's the job of the PR professional to either enhance that that uh, perception or change that perception um, to make that reputation stronger. And on that, I always like to talk about how we all have a personal brand, so we all have a personal yeah. reputation. And when you're representing a company, you're communicating on behalf of their brand voice. And we've all had that moment, right, where your friend is like, "What is wrong with you today? Why are you acting like that?" Well, you're off brand, right? You're not being funny. You're not going up to them, making sure they're okay, whatever it is you're doing that's different, you're off your brand. And your audience sees that. So if you're representing a corporation or a celebrity and they're off brand, their audience is immediately gonna know. Mm -hmm. or Lindsay Lohan. Right. She, um, you know, there was a, a couple years ago when she got nabbed for the second DUI in the course of one summer, you know, her name was everywhere. You couldn't turn on the, you couldn't turn on CNN. Apparently there were no wars or anything. We were all just going to talk about <laughs> Lindsay Lohan. And you couldn't, you couldn't escape her. And this is the, the same week that she got arrested the second time, she actually had a film that came out called I Know Who Killed Me. And it, <laughs> who, who saw it? Who went, to, who went to the theater and saw it? One, two, three. Okay. I went to the theater? Wow. All right. It, it didn't even open in the top ten. And you would think, you know, there's this publicity going on. You know, everybody's talking about Lindsay Lohan. But it wasn't, um, it, first of all, it was bad publicity. It was also bad publicity that wasn't um, attached to a single product. Like, for instance, Madonna's stuff that she used to do, you had to go to her concert to see what she did. You had to buy her album. You had to buy her book, whatever. You didn't have to go see some crappy movie to find out what was going on with Lindsay Lohan. So, yes, so her, her, that film tanked, and it was her third film in a row that tanked. And so suddenly she became a really bad risk. She couldn't be, uh, she couldn't be uh, insured as an actress. She couldn't, uh, you know, everybody thought she couldn't, film, uh, she couldn't carry a film. And so she lost, in the weeks after that, she lost nine projects that were um, things that she was in talks for or that she had already signed on for, including the Transformers trilogy. Uh, she, that, that role went to Megan Fox instead. She lost about $45 million. So if you think that there's no such thing as bad publicity, talk to Lindsay Lohan. She might disagree. <laughs> and then you have the opposite with Miley Cyrus. And, you know, all her bad publicity has been surrounded by what, though? Her product, whether it's the music, the videos, the tour. And so that works for her because, and you've seen an increase in both her um, awareness and sales because she's created the bad publicity around the product. And that's the difference. Can bad publicity work for you? Absolutely. But is there such a thing as bad publicity? Yes. And so it's up to you to, again, be authentic to your brand, understand what your brand is, and then follow that. Steve is a New York Times bestseller for a book on Tiger Woods. And Tiger Woods is one of those that went where bad publicity did not work in his favor. Exactly. And just to add from the corporate side, if you're a brand, a company, mm -hmm. it's all about how you respond to bad publicity as right. it's happening. So you have to be involved, be a part of the conversation, and be prepared to muddle through it so that you can get to the other side and move forward with your audience and hopefully be more proactive than yes. reactive. Absolutely. 
I think the main difference that um, they're talking about between Lindsay Lohan and um, Miley Cyrus is Miley Cyrus's publicity was very intentional, possibly even planned. I think of the um, the photo of her when she was in Amsterdam and she had the marijuana, and I really felt like that was staged. It was part of the, the image that they're trying to create for her. Whereas Lindsay Lohan, out of control, right? right. She's out of control. There, there was no control over her what she was doing, her publicity or anything, and it made her look really irresponsible, completely irresponsible. And as Steve mentioned, if, if you have millions of dollars wrapped up into an actor and you need to be on time with your production, you're not going to take that risk. You're not, it's just not going to happen. So that's the difference between using bad publicity that can work for you, like my, Miley Cyrus, or bad publicity that you just stepped in it because you were irresponsible. And that's, that's the, the way that I would, I would work that. So I, I agree, of course, because I think even the title of Miley's song, right, Wrecking Ball, made it clear that she was going to demolish this old image, and it was all part of a very strategic campaign. Now that dumb song is going to be in my head all day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and I, you, I can't help but wonder now which way uh, Justin Bieber's going to go, right, with, with his recent arrest. But when we think about responding to crises, uh, when cable, see, I'm old, so I remember these innovations like cable television. Um, <laughs> and so when cable television and CNN began, it was all of a sudden we had 24-hour news channels instead of, you know, the flag and, and the end of broadcasting at midnight. Um, and it became a 24-7 news cycle. And then with the development of social media and digital uh, and online platforms and communication technologies, it became closer to a half second news cycle is what they're actually calling it now, it appears in the literature. So I wondered, and with your experience and, and maybe some um, you know, examples you could explain how the development of social and digital media and communication technologies have changed the nature of uh, communications and public relations, as well as crisis communications, especially in responding to a crisis? Well, to build off of what Elizabeth was just saying, you have to be proactive and not reactive. So before you begin launching a campaign, which I'm sure Miley's camp did on, on her end, they were prepared for every crisis that was going to come at them because they had some great responses. Mm -hmm. They were in real time. They were prepared to get involved. And with brands, with corporations, if small businesses, before you start a marketing campaign or any communication effort, you need to think about any way that your audience might turn on you and how you would respond to it just in case it happens. You're not, obviously, you don't want it to happen, but if it does, you need to be prepared for any crisis that might occur, who the voice of your brand is going to be, how you're going to stay on point, and what channels you're going to use to engage. But you really need to be proactive. You need to be monitoring what's happening online. You need to be involved in those conversations to get through it. Yeah, it's basically changed how brands communicate. Mm -hmm. um, it's given a sense of ownership to the brands more so because typically, traditionally, uh, anytime there is any information communicated by the brand, you communicated it through the media. Mm -hmm. Media still's there, and Steve will talk about that, but you now have more control over the message, uh, and it's very important, more, even more so important for you to try to control that message and engage and, and have a response with, with, your, with your customers through social media. Um, my course slogan is, it's all about the <laughs> buzz, <laughs> uh, and that's exactly what it is in, in today's uh, marketplace. So it's really important for you to help create that buzz, manage that buzz, uh, and extend that buzz. Part of the thing, you know, social media, we have to keep remembering that it really is just a few years old. I mean, mm -hmm. um, I, I always use this example. I was uh, at a party one time with Lance Bass from NSYNC, and he was talking about this MySpace thing, and I collect these friends, and then these friends have friends. And I'm like, that is the dumbest thing I have ever heard in my <laughs> entire life. And now we're all doing it. Everybody does it. And, um, you know, one of the problems with social media, though, is that everybody feels like they have a platform now and they have an opinion and just just look at your if you don't believe me look at your facebook feed during an election week and see what you know everybody thinks that they want to get their thing out there so one thing that that is good about it on a pr standpoint is that you know exactly what people are saying about you now you didn't know before you don't have to do the type of focus groups that you used to have to do the negative thing is that just a few 
unhappy people can really spread a message a lot further than they used to be able to do. So, you know, if you are working in PR and you're working, you know, trying to, sh to manage a brand, um, you know, we're still in, a, in the infancy on how you're going to end up dealing with that. But that's something to be aware of, that, that just a few angry people can make you look really bad. I have a funny story about social media. Yeah. But first I want to tell you, I just recently read a quote from Warren Buffett that said um, something like, it takes 20 years to build a brand. It takes five minutes to destroy it. Mm -hmm. That is so true on social media. And um, because my companies are in Asia and they're very review-based companies, I always have to monitor social media. And we've been really lucky um, to get mostly five-star reviews, but a couple months ago, this man literally held me hostage with his TripAdvisor review. And he wrote me this email, and thank God I, I monitor you know, these things daily. But he wrote me this email about the kayaking trip that he and his girlfriend or whatever were, you know, they wanted to go on it, they were so excited, complete disaster. Of course, this is from my company. And he said, you know, they, they, we had this beach camp set up and there were these huge speakers on the beach, they were playing loud music, I don't, I don't know what. Again, I wasn't there. You know, your guide went and got a haircut and left us way. And I was like, haircut? Oh, no. So he's like, look, this is the review I have ready for TripAdvisor. You're going to give me a partial refund or else. And I mean, this is serious for me, right? We, we have mostly five-star reviews. So luckily, and I've always had this in place um, <clears throat> for my businesses because they're um, customer service-based service businesses, that I have a policy that we always give, give you your money back, guaranteed. I, I don't care. I don't care if you went on Everest Base Camp Trek and it was $1,500 and I have to hand, hand you over $1,500 in rupees. That's a lot of rupees. But I will hand it over because that's my cost of business and my reputation is worth it. So I already, when this man had the TripAdvisor review ready to go, ready to post, I was like, okay, look, look. I'm not just going to give you a partial refund. I'm going to give you a full refund. Here's one for you and your girlfriend. He was so ecstatic and happy. They actually ended up writing writing a nice, nice review for us um, about how good the company was. He didn't comment on the kayaking trip or whatever, but this is a good company and, and a company that I trust. Um, this is really important uh, for, for any place that you have, like if you own a restaurant or something like I do, where you're going to have reviews because that trust is... It's the main thing. And I've done a little research on it, and they, they've said that about 66% of people, when they see a bad review online, but they see that the management or the public relations person has responded to it, it will um, create a positive conversion for that company. Because again, they're not just seeing a bunch of five-star reviews, which could be fake. They're seeing something negative that the company handled appropriately. And then that, that builds the trust for you. So yes, I'm always a hostage to social media, constantly um, monitoring, but uh, you know, try to do the right thing and have a contingency plan ahead of time. Yeah, and, and the purpose of social media is not to promote, but to engage and have a conversation with your customer, um, whether that's a fan, a friend, a follower, whoever it is. Um, whether, again, with that, whether that brand is an artist or uh, an actual company. So it's really important for you to do that, and that's how social media, again, has impacted the PR industry because it's not about advertising, which is all about paid promotion, um, and that's why the PR professionals have really kind of taken ownership over the social media landscape uh, because it's about having a conversation and, and managing relationships with those different customers, and social media plays such an important role for that. And you, right now, as your own brand or your own representative, because you're basically you're your own PR professional right now for your own brand. So you, right now, have a chance to take control of that and put out the brand that you want people to see. And you're already doing that through your Facebook or through your Twitter, whatever photo you put out there, whatever post. So you have to think about that. And I always, you know, I suggest to students to really question and think before you tweet or think before you post um, because it's out there and it's out there forever. And anyone can use whatever you say, the media can pick up on mm -hmm. it and it can be part of a story. And so you want it to be your story and you want it to be the story you want to tell. So you have to kind of be aware of that. And you also do have to decide who are you going to engage with and who are you not going to engage right. with. You can't, you know, every so often, I love it when a celebrity gets into a big Twitter fight with some <laughs> random fan who says, I didn't like your album, and then they go back and forth. I mean, that's great, you know, it's great, it's great fun, fun to watch, <laughs> but it's not good PR. And I'll use a personal example on this one. If you Google my name, um, on the first page, you find a Facebook hate group against Steve Helling. There's about a hundred and something people on it because, and the, let, let me explain. <laughs> because there's nothing to hate. The National Enquirer ran a story that 
I was Casey Anthony's boyfriend. Oh my God. And so all of a sudden these hate groups came. I'm like, oh my God, no, ew. Um, <laughs> you know, but, uh, and, you know, so it was this thing that suddenly now there's these people. And frankly, I mean, I'm not trying to stereotype, but everybody who's on there, basically their profile picture is of their cat. So, um, <laughs> you know, leave it, take it as you wish. Not that there's anything wrong with it. Not that there's anything wrong with it, but, you know, but, you know. Uh, so, so. Cat. I could go on to that group. It's an open group. I could certainly go on and try and defend myself. Right. But I don't think it's necessary. In fact, I think it would be a, a really bad decision. So now, personally, you know, you were taught this, you know, when you're a little kid and somebody says something bad about you, you want to go tell on them, you want to get, you want to give it back. Sometimes you have to stand back and just say, you know what, people are going to say stuff. This is a, you know, we live in a, in a world where things are public. And sometimes you just let it go. And, you know, I, not to say that I'm thrilled about it, but it is kind of cool. I can say I have a Facebook <laughs> hate group against me. So, right. Know. Sometimes you have to learn not to take it personally, even right. though, yes, it is personal. It's, they're talking about you. But sometimes you have to learn and realize, maybe not even learn, but just realize that you have to let it go. Mm -hmm. And you kind of just have to let things be. And again, pick your battles, choose your, you know, choose your com conversations yeah. that you want to have. So when a brand is in crisis mode, what or when would it be appropriate for the PR professional to urge them to say no comment? And then I was hoping maybe from our uh, journalists we could get the perspective of how that no comment is interpreted or what your next steps are when you hear no comment from uh, a spokesperson or for somebody in crisis management mode. Well, I think it's always, 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 100% of the time, a mistake to use the words no comment. Me too. And the reason why is, you know, if, if I'm calling you because, you know, so-and-so is, you know, I'm hearing that, so, you know, that your client is, you know, a convicted felon and whatever, and you say no comment, the answer to that is, you know, I have no contest to that. What I would say is what you do is if something negative is happening, you don't have to give a comment immediately. What you do is you say, okay, what's your deadline? I'll get back with you um, before that deadline, and I'm going to have something for you. You can write something that does not necessarily have a comment, but it has words to it that, that um, and I get them all the time. You know, um, you know, if somebody gets arrested for drunk driving, I might get a three-sentence co um, comment that it's like, and it's always emailed to me. That way I can't misquote it. You know, it's, it's. They're on point. You know, so-and-so is aware of the case against them. You know, they are against drunk driving in any way, shape, or form. Please respect their privacy at this time. You know, I get that. That is a comment that's really a no comment. They're aware, well, of course they're aware of the charges against them. That's not, you know, that's not, of course. And of course they're against drunk driving. We're all against drunk driving. Nobody <laughs> thinks that's great. You know, let's go out and, ooh. But, you know, and the same thing, but they are making a comment and that can be used and at least in some way they're addressing in in a you know addressing a little bit about the scandal against them saying no comment basically is saying yeah i drove drunk i'm embarrassed i'm not talking about it and that's not what you want to do yeah. so and from the from a corporation's point of view if you have a small business it's going to start internally so you want to be able to empower your employees mm -hmm. to respond so if a journalist happens to come into your business and is speaking to your front end clerk they know exactly what to say you know what i need to get you in touch with elizabeth neff and they have her contact information mm -hmm. so you're not saying no comment you're giving them the right person that can give them that reply so you need to be prepared and internal communications are huge yes. for a crisis everybody at your corporation your company small business business, large business needs to know how to respond, who to put them in touch with, and be able to move forward. Yeah, even more so with social media, because again, even your employees become your spokespeople, you know, spokesperson mm -hmm. representatives of the brand. So it's up to the PR department or the PR professional to ensure they educate the employees to know what to say, what not to say, mm -hmm. who to talk to, who not to talk to. So it's all, again, that, you know, pre-planning, um, proactive nature. Yeah. And it's important, that, by the way, that I say to Catherine Rodriguez that I agree that cats are not bad. <laughs> Whoever just tweeted that at me, I'm sorry. I didn't mean anything bad about cats. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, we're seeing your tweets. We're going to respond to tweets, questions at the end. So keep tweeting. <laughs> no comment? 
No comment? No, no. No comment. <laughs> what I mean is I'm aware guilty. of the question, <laughs> and I'm taking it into consideration. I'm, exactly. I'm going to tweet you yeah. my answer later. Okay, so when we're in a crisis communication mode or, or just generally executing public relations strategies and tactics, we hear a, a buzzwords a lot like transparent and authentic. And I think we use those words a lot without maybe having a very clear idea of what they mean. So how do I have an authentic brand voice on Facebook? Or how do I have present myself in a transparent fashion through Twitter. And I just wondered if anybody had any comments or, or how do journalists or do journalists do research on social media and, and find information about stories and people um, through those uh, digital platforms? Uh, yes, of course. Um, it, you know, things are so much easier now than, you know, I've been at this for a while and I was doing, you know, this job way before social media. And the nice thing about social media from a brand standpoint is, yes, you can put things out there. You can say things, you know, um, uh, you can get your message across and then a journalist will actually, you know, if I'm doing a story on somebody, the, one of the first things I do is I, I look at their social media. I, I look to see what they have to say. So, yes, we do use it. We're aware of it. And that's why it's so important to be very careful about what you're saying. Um, also, keep in mind that um, we go back through your social media. Um, you know, we don't just, you know, if tomorrow, I'm making this up. I, in fact, I won't even use a name. If tomorrow an A-list celebrity, you know, shoots somebody in the head, we're going to, of course, re, uh, you know, report on everything that they say on Twitter now. But if six months ago they made a comment about, just got my new gun, here's a picture, we're going to run that too. So you've got to really be forward thinking in what you put on the online because you don't know, none of us know what the future holds, but keep in mind that everything you say can be used against you or for you. And that means the stuff you're tweeting now. I mean, I don't know what the future of Twitter is. No, nobody does. We don't know if in two, what is this? This is, we don't know if 2024, if people are still going to be able to search your archives. I don't know. But just pretend that that's definitely the case. And to me, being authentic means being true to you um, and understanding who you are and the brand, again, that you want to portray, and then just being true to that. And transparent to me means just don't lie, purposefully lie, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I always kind of say in class, never promise what you can't deliver. But it's that same thing, like, for you and your brand, you want to be transparent. You want people to see you. You don't want to try to hide things. Um, purposefully that's you know that's gonna come back to bite you in the end so again be authentic to yourself meaning be true to you understand who you are and I always encourage that before you even get ready to start using Facebook Twitter or you know promoting your brand in any whether it's traditional or, or non-traditional media channels to understand that brand and understand how you're going to differentiate it so that you can proactively then communicate that and then being transparent, knowing that people can have, have access and people want access to your brand. So you want to give that, whether that's artist or a company, mm -hmm. you want the fans, friends, and followers of those brands to feel a sense of ownership. And that's where the transparency comes in, is that sense of ownership that they have. And social media, of course, uh, you know, gives that even more so. And I think part of David's question, too, talked about having consistency in social channels, right? And when you think about a brand, you have an emotional connection with them, whether it's a celebrity brand or a sports team or Harley Davidson. You understand that that brand stands for something and you're emotionally connected to it in some way. Apple, yeah. right? We're all connected in some way to a brand. I think sports teams have the most emotional followers, but there's a consistency with their brand voice. Whether right. you walk into the store or you see them in social media, mm -hmm. you understand what their brand is about, and that's what connects you to it. So, and I think Harley Davidson definitely, you get that badass mm -hmm. feel, you get mm -hmm. what they're about, you know, and anyone can become that simply by participating in their brand. Whether you own one or you follow them on Twitter, you feel that brand element. Right, those big brands are those brands that you do feel a sense of connection to are the ones that are being authentic and transparent right. to themselves. Mm -hmm. I have um, 
I have some interesting background with authenticity when I first opened my companies in Nepal. The, um, the guides always want to come across as being as, as wealthy as we privileged Westerners who, who visit their country. And so they are always asking for, you know, can they get the nicest clothes and things like that. And I do try to provide that for them, but they always try to downplay the, their, um, their economy in that country. And so what I did is I, I, I looked at the company and I said, you know, how can we be authentic about, about who we are and what, and what we're doing here and create our brand story? And um, my husband is my co-partner in the company and um, he is from Nepal and he's from the lowest caste in Nepal and people are usually very embarrassed about that because there's a lot of discrimination. So what I did is, is I thought a lot about that and I created a brand story around that and we actually developed a training program where we take the um, boys from the villages uh, who have potential to be rock climbing guides or, or great kayakers or something like that and we train them and we so we created this um, training program from that and that became that authenticity of what the original guides were at first embarrassed about became part of our our brand story and it was a big leap for me to try to convince them that you guys have to own this you guys it's okay to own this because they had put up with all of this discrimination um, in their own country um, and I don't think had they not heard it from somebody who was from a western country they, they would have believed that you know what when you tell people this is my story this is what I came from out of my village and now look, I can support my family. I have a good job. If you come with our company, this is what you're supporting. I said, I promise you that all of our American guests, our European guests, Australian, it, it will endear you to them. And it took quite a few years to develop that. But but now, yeah, people have, have emailed me sometimes and said, I, I specifically picked your company out of, we have huge competition and p picked yours because I knew that you guys were doing something better for other people. And so now we do try to promote that through social media and that type of thing because it, it benefits the brand, that authenticity. Not always easy to find, but something that worked for us. Mm, interesting. So kind of the opposite of being authentic and transparent, especially in crisis communications, and um, I wonder how this is handled from both perspectives of PR and journalists. So there's a crisis, my brand is in crisis, and the journalist wants a comment, and I say, well, you know what? Off the record, I think he maybe did it, you know? And I wonder if it's ever appropriate for the PR professional to provide the journalist with some maybe background or some, you know, really uh, juicy <laughs> comments, but they want them to keep them off the record. And um, if there is such a thing anymore with hot mics and um, and cell phones everywhere. So as, is there such a thing as off the record? You go first. From the PR perspective, um, there is no such thing as off the record. Um, everything you say, uh, you have to think of. Every, everything you say, everything you tweet, everything you Facebook is technically on the record and can be used to help you or to be used against you. So, um, and I have... I know we're running out of time, but I, I, my students know I have some, you know, good stories with, you know, off the record. Now, here's the thing too, and Steve, is follow up on this. Sometimes, again, why you hire the PR professionals is because of the relationships that they have with the journalists, uh, with the media outlets. And sometimes those relationships can be really strong, like Steve and I, to where he and I actually can have off the record conversations. And because of the trust that's been built through the decade, more than a decade of working with each other, that's different. But most of the time, that's not the case. So I always tell clients and tell students, never believe in off the record. There's always such thing as, I mean, there's never such a thing. But again, there's always an exception. So that's why I say, because Steve and I have off the record conversations all the time. Um, but it's only because of the trust that, you know, that we have there and the re working relationship that we have. And I would say, and God is my witness, I have never um, burned anybody on the off the record thing. Right. But, but I've been burned. But, you, but not by me. No, by, not. Right, so. <laughs> by other reporters yeah. I've been burned. Um, you know, generally though, um, I don't, I, you know, not everybody can say that. And yes, yeah. you, a lot of times people say things, and, and some journalists will, pl will play little semantics like you have to say it beforehand, and then we all have to agree, and then we have to pinky swear. And, you know, <laughs> they do this, and then, you know, that's their out to do it. I, I prefer to, to try and keep a good relationship with PR, and, and so I kind of understand the, the, the spirit of what they're saying. You know, I really can't get into this. I will give you some background. Yeah, you know, that's fine, and, and I'll use that. Um, you know, generally, 
um, I, I find a lot of PR people now, especially in Hollywood, a lot of celebrity type of things, their publicists use off the record and use not for attribution, like a source close to, you know, CeeLo Green says this, you know, um, the source, here's this total secret to... It, the source is usually a publicist of some sort right. who wants to get something out there without getting something out there. So, you know, it can be used that way, but you do have to be careful because you don't know who you can trust. It's, uh, it, it's um, you know, if you haven't worked with a specific reporter, um, you know, you really have to assume that every single word you say is going to be used just because, uh, and that means jokes too. Sometimes you'll say a, something that's clearly a joke and you'll see it in print that doesn't look like a joke mm -hmm. and that can Confidence. really come back to hurt you. So, so just keep in mind that, you know, you can become friends with reporters if you work in, in marketing and everything, but until you are, they're not your friends. And believe me, I'm going to say, you know, oh yeah, that's, that's really crazy. That reminds me of this other time with another one of your clients and, you know, we're not your friends. I'm sorry. We can, uh, and, and don't, don't <laughs> fall into that into that trap because yeah. it can be bad. Media are famous for being very passive aggressive. No. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, so it's really up to, the, again, the PR professional to understand that relationship and know any, not only the relationship with the, uh, with the reporter, but the relationship with the magazine or the mm -hmm. reputation of that magazine. You know, Steve works for the world's largest, you know, magazine, People Magazine, and they have a great reputation. And that's why the big stars will go to people because they know they can trust them. Again, National Enquirer, that, who said that, you know, he was Casey's boyfriend, not that same level. So again, you know, in dealing with that publication, no matter who you're talking to, to be on the publication, you're not going to have that off the record comfortability. But yeah, that's it. I can speak a little bit to that as a um, documentary filmmaker. It, it's it's the, the same like Steve when you're a journalist. It, it's your job to get that story, whatever the story is, whether it's good or bad or whatever. And I know, um, especially making documentaries about sensitive subjects, we know how to interview people. We know how to make you like us so that you will tell us your story. And I've had a lot of off the record, like, oh, can we turn the camera off type of conversations. But I will tell you this, those off camera conversations shaped what I was doing in yes. the editing room, shaped what the on camera things were. And I kind of thought to myself, you know, I know that that guy didn't say this on camera, but I know what he meant, and I have this sound bite mm -hmm. here, and that type of thing. And and like Steve said, you can't be friends with everybody, and, and maybe you're not. But as a journalist, it is our job to get to get that story. I mean, that's just the that's the reality of it. Um, we try to be balanced and fair and ethical. I would never say anything that's untrue or purposely try to get somebody in trouble. But when I put a story together for a documentary. It's my choice. It's my choice. So yeah, really be careful. And you're off off the record. Don't say anything. My rule would be just don't. Whatever you don't want the world to know, right. just, just don't say it. Keep it. Tell tell your mom or somebody. But don't <laughs> tell. Don't tell anybody in the media. Though, as a member of the media, please do tell right. me. <laughs> tell me. I'm out of that business. Now. So I believe we are transitioning to uh, questions, Q and A part of our session. All right, this morning. A, a, um, while you guys are lining up, Adrian tweeted, how do you take on a situation if your client is unreceptive to your urge to stop acting out? Oh. <laughs> I'm going to go with Steve. For no, that's, not, that's, that's oh, all no, you so guys. That's me. Oh, yeah. that's right. Sorry. How do you take on a situation if your client is unreceptive to your urge to stop acting out? You slap them. No. Um, <laughs> kidding. <laughs> That's a, it's, a, it's hard to represent artists that don't want to hear your advice. Um, it's kind of your job then to try to show them. And that's Adrian, Adrian you want to wave. Um, it's, it's, your, it's your job to try to counsel them on, on the, the pros and cons of listening to you or not listening to you. Um, sometimes that's why I think a lot of artists um, hire their publicists or have a publicist and have them handle their social media stuff as well to try to help control the, the conversation, um, which, believe it or not, most people you're tweeting to, sometimes celebrities, it's probably not them always tweeting. Sometimes it is. About half, I would say 50-50. And so it's, 
it's then it's up to you as a publicist to decide, okay, if they're unwilling to hear your counsel and work with you, then you have to decide ethically, do you want to represent them? Do you want to continue to represent them? Um, because ultimately it's your reputation. Some of you know that I've worked for two companies that have been raided by the FBI. Um, one of my former boss sits in federal prison. And um, I came, I had to come to a realization at some point and remove myself from that situation because clearly I, underst I realized that I didn't know the whole story. And I wasn't comfortable then acting as a spokesperson for him or the company, so I removed myself from the situation. So again, it's kind of you understanding you your own integrity and morals and understanding if you can't persuade them, then maybe that's not a good relationship. You're welcome. Come on, questions, questions. Uh, yes, this is referring to sports. It seems to me like sports franchises always try to steer their players away from the bad boy image. My question is, why do you see, why do you think that the bad boy image works for music and movies and not in sports? Well, I think it does work in I sports. Um, I mean, we, Dennis Rodman does do, it does work for him. But Steve, what I think is, if it goes against your brand, like Tiger Woods, and I want Steve to kind of talk right. about that. Um, you know, yeah, Tiger Woods is a great example that that that. His the he had put a, the squeaky clean image out there for 13 years, and then when it all came crashing down, it came crashing down badly. But I think, and it also depends on the specific sport. I think we all kind of ex expect for the NFL to be full of a lot of bad boys. I, I think I mean, it doesn't shock us. I mean, I'll tell you this: nothing about the Rich Richie Incognito scandal has shocked me. I'm, I'm not sitting there saying, oh my goodness, I had no idea that these NFL players talk to each other this way. I, I always just kind of assumed that they did. And so I think... Same with basketball. Yeah, too, right? exactly. There's trash talk and that's fine. So I think that if you... And authentic is the word that we can use. If your client is a bad boy, they need to have a bad boy image. Don't try and make them squeaky clean because when the mask falls off, it will fall off with a thud, um, and you don't want that to happen. So I, I think generally, um, and you may disagree with this, or, but I think generally the bad boy image works in most sports. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Again, unless it goes against, you know, like if, who's, I don't follow sports, but like, <laughs> is it? Tim is Tebow. Tebow. Oh yeah, yeah. so I, I was gonna say him. But yeah, so if Tebow <laughs> like all of a sudden came out and like, you know, was sick, ritually, you know, doing satanic rituals, <laughs> you know, that would be, that would go against his brand and that would be a problem. Right? Because <laughs> right? it would be the God, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Again, not sports. Talk to me music. I'm in sports. Uh, my question is about the, the movie Blackfish. I just want to know if you guys have seen it and what do you guys think about I've seen Blackfish. Go I ahead. haven't seen it. Well, I think that Blackfish was detrimental to SeaWorld and um, any other type of, of aquarium. Um, I think it's a documentary that, that needed to happen. I thought it was really well researched, um, maybe a bit one-sided in the fact that they didn't talk about any of the good that these things um, actually do. But, you know, I have a bias. I, I don't believe in, in caging animals and, and things like that. Um, so yeah, I, I thought that it was a, a great documentary um, needed to happen, but I think SeaWorld had huge, huge problems after that came out. They had cancellations of, of singers that were supposed to sing over the holidays and things like that. And I don't think that they've repaired their reputation since then. I would love to see what, how their sales figures dropped for SeaWorld around, around the country. Yeah, they have, I mean, it, to me, again, I haven't watched it, but, you know, my knowledge, it's a propaganda film, and those have a place in the, in the marketplace. Um, but I do, I do give props to SeaWorld for how they've handled the situation, mm -hmm. and they've done a really good job on addressing it. There's always two sides to the story, um, and I think they have done a really good, from a PR perspective, I think they've done a really good job. Yeah. Unfortunately, just the nature of the subject, they're not, they're not going to win, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, they can't. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. What you Thank you. Um, good morning. Good morning. I love penguins, by the way. Um, Hi. I have a question for Steve and then one for the panel. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as the Tiger Woods thing, how much of that do you think is because he can't win anymore? <laughs> no, he stopped winning after the scandal. So when the scandals, when this whole thing happened, he was still number one. So this, everything that has happened has happened since then. And the last time that I sat down with Tiger Woods before the scandal, 
uh, we did a four page, I wrote a four page story and the whole four page story was, I'm just, you know, I couldn't be happier, wife, kids, you know, I'm just so happy, she's just, she's my equal, she's wonderful and everything. And, and I did the, it was up in New York and I did the, um, I figured out after the fact that she was in Sweden when he did the, that interview and I think he went to hang out with his girlfriend after he was done with, with my interview. Um, you know, he put out something that wasn't true. Now, at the end of the day, the Tiger Woods scandal was a rich, young, good-looking athlete likes to have sex. Not Stop happy. the presses. But, you know, um, the, the bottom line was because they had spent 13 years building, uh, building something that didn't ultimately turn out to be true, that's why it became the scandal that it did. If Dennis Rodman had done the same thing, yeah. no, nobody would even remember it. Right. So, uh, Do you think it would have went away faster, though, if, if you would have been winning? No, I don't. I don't. I think... Um, I think the scandal was what the scandal was. And then, you know, his wife, you know, came out and talked about it. And it just, the scandal wouldn't have gone away. But winning, uh, winning would have helped him perhaps keep, hold on to some of his endorsements, right, which would have been a good say, thing. Yeah. So. My second question was about the um, reality and spiritual side of the media. Oh, like I, see, I see a lot of people get in trouble and then they go to maybe gospel or like, do you think they're advised by PR people to help straighten their image out by going to either Christian or gospel or? Oh, you mean like switching genres? Yes, having a change of heart. I mean, I no. I mean, I'd like to think it's true to the person. What, yeah. what I will say that they, what some artists are doing now, is switching to country, and that is that's just strategic because that's the popular genre. But I, I don't necessarily see. I mean, Katy Perry started out as a Christian artist and then switched um, to, as we know her today, <laughs> kissing a girl. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't. I, typically, that's not coming from the publicist. That's going to come from maybe even the artist manager or the artist on taking it into a different generation or trying, or, I mean, t t different genre and trying to reach a new market. But typically I would think they're gonna be authentic to who they are. But it is, it is a strategic point either from the label or the artist manager to sometimes have artists go into a different genre or start in some genre and then switch to another. I think that um, one disaster that happened uh, with PR and, and kind of turning the spiritual road was with Paula Deen. So when Paula Deen came under fire, she immediately went and um, had um, Jesse Jackson kind of endorse her and say like, no, you know what, it's okay, she's, she's a good lady. That again snowballed and, and everybody was offended that she would even go that route at, at that point. So it's, yeah, that's a, a hard line. And I think it comes across as inauthentic when you do something bad and then you immediately go, you know, but but I'm a this, I'm a holy person now. I, I do think that that can happen to you. I think that these really um, traumatic, tragic things that happen in your life, especially when you're responsible for that, it does put you on a new path. But in terms of your public image, you need a, a bit of time. You need time and space between that. You don't, you know, do, do a Paula Deen and offend people and then turn around and, and um, get Je Jesse Jackson on your side and then re-offend people with that act as, as well. So I, I definitely think it can backfire on you. You have to be really careful. I was thinking more of a R. Kelly. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> Look, I'll tell you. Yeah, the gospel record. Off the record. Directly off after it. I... I think I'm I'm a cynic. He's done uh, it twice. What's that? <laughs> He's done it twice. Yeah. I, well, and you know I, I. But I'll tell you this: when I think of R. Kelly, I don't think of gospel. No. <laughs> and so I don't know that it was ultimately helpful to him. Thank. You. Mm -hmm. I won't tell you what I think of when I think of R. Kelly. <laughs> don't drink that water. So in relation to. <laughs> mm. In relation to the like no comment situation. Is there ever a time when they should say, like, yes, I did drunk drive and I, I had a problem and I'm trying to take these steps or own up, kind of? Is that ever beneficial? Oh, absolutely. But you do that on Oprah. You, right. you, 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 I mean, that's what, that, that is pretty much what Oprah's for. Absolutely. Um, yeah, you, you, and, and 
if you get caught doing something, if there's a big thing, then you start figuring out what is an outlet that I can do that's a respected outlet that I can get my side across. Um, you know, maybe shed a few tears on TV. That always helps. You know, and that, they do that on purpose. So when you see on, and you, Oprah has always been the one. Um, you know, when you see the Oprah special with her sitting down with somebody who's talking about, oh, I went to hell and back and did this and that. That's that's very calculated, and it's it's really the right move. I think with Oprah, you still have to, I mean, she's still a journalist. So when you're Lance Armstrong mm -hmm. and you go on there with a mea culpa that's not authentic right. Right. and that's not genuine, mm -hmm. it creates more problems when you are saying, but I'm still a victim and I think I should still be able to compete even though I lied and cheated for all these years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to, you, one of the rules of public relations is you really do always have to own your truth. Mm -hmm. No matter, there is no sidestepping that. In my classes, I, I teach critical thinking and timing. And so uh, you have to think that through. And if Oprah is part of your strategy, then you have to think, okay, I know I can't lie, mm -hmm. but what can I say in the meantime? What can I say between now and Oprah mm -hmm. to, to, um, to plan my messaging? And that's, that's how you have to be strategic, if you're lucky enough to get on Oprah for some type of redemption. <laughs> <laughs> Hi there. I have a question regarding the Lindsay Lohan <laughs> situation where yes. she got like this bad information about her. Do you think there could have been a way where she could have used that information in her favor and kind of flip her around so it doesn't impact her in a negative way. I, well, I think, you know, there's this thing that with somebody, and you can't always do this. If you're a business or something, you can't always do this. But um, somebody like Lindsay Lohan, we can't miss you until you go away. So she, she you know, I think you don't necessarily have to do something immediately when you get caught with your hand in the cookie jar. Sometimes it's a good thing to go away a little yeah. bit and then to come back after you've had an appropriate amount of time to reflect on your sins and be able to confess those sins. And I mean, that's something that, that a good publicist would tell somebody to do. Yeah, sometimes you need to disappear from the public eye. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And then I don't know that this would have ever been used for good for her, but she could have mitigated it a little bit if she... Um, you know, if she went away, then she came back, and then she really did change her behavior, which, well, hasn't quite happened yet. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hello, Hi. I'm Jan Philippe Ducret from Panama. This is a question for you guys. Okay, so we see celebrities, right? Uh, they shine and they disappear. That's why they're called stars, right? <laughs> Do you think America loved them, see them grow, and then, then watch them go through meltdown? Yes. Or do you believe this is just created by the media to take more money and distract people from what is really important in this world? Because I care way much more from different things that is happening in this world. For example, what is going on in Venezuela right now. Mm -hmm. That it's people dying on the streets, fighting for democracy, rather to see Justin Bieber escaping from the world and going to Panama, which is my country. So <laughs> this is just my point of view. Mm -hmm. I would like to know your point of view uh, because the media is going to distract us from, obviously, what it's really important. So, Well, I hate to bring this up, and I think that's a really good question. Because it is a business at the end. Yes, we understand it is that. a business. Yeah. And, yeah. and yes, we are distracting you. We are distracting you from Venezuela, but we're not distracting. It is not a, you know, there's no conspiracy that we don't want you to know about Venezuela. The, what it is, is that, and, and go to another country and look at what BBC covers, or look at what, what's covered there. It's totally different than what CNN covers or whatever. Yeah. And frankly, yes, we give the American public what the American public will watch, what they will buy, what they will look at. And unfortunately, the American public does, has, does not show the interest when it comes to the, the, the clicks on the, on the websites or whatever. They don't show the interest in what's, you know, in an earthquake that's happening in Haiti or, you know, the, the uprising in Venezuela. They don't show that because, you know, you don't see that in the news as much because that's not what the American public will consume. It doesn't affect us. So right. we feel we feel uh, disassociated from it. But but can I let America off the hook for a second? Because mm -hmm. I lived for, for many, many years in Asia. And um, 
I can tell you this. I'm 100% sure, and the, the statistics are there. Bollywood is much bigger than Hollywood. Hmm. And you are kidding yourself if you don't think that people in India, all over Asia, and the Middle East, this is all um, distributed Bollywood films, are not doing exactly what we are in America and going gaga over the stars. Um, and, I, I, you know, I've seen women that, that can't get up in the morning because their favorite Bollywood hero, man star, is... is you know, sick, or they heard the report that he was in the hospital. So it's a it's a worldwide phenomenon. This wanting to to see stars and and be part of their life and and see what's going on, and it is a distra- distraction for us, for all of us as humanity. It's um, part of our escapism. And um, in America and and some other places in the world, we just consume that on a much higher level because we can, because we can, because we're not in the thick of the war. We're not in the thick of, of doing that, so it's easier to disassociate ourselves from it and go for the happy place rather than the, oh my gosh, did you see the blood and guts in Syria right now or something right. like that. It's just um, it's a choice that, we, that we've decided to make for ourselves. Well, and I think, and John Fleet, I completely agree, and it's very profound what you said, but I feel that it's until you guys make the educated decision to then not buy the papers, not buy the magazines, not click on the TMZ articles, not um, watch the the tabloid stuff that's happening. Only until that culture shift changes will then the media stop reporting that stuff. Because unfortunately, those the stories that you see on television, here on the radio, and um, and listen to, are all because that's what's selling, mm-hmm. and who sell who buys it the general public, not necessarily you, but you click on stories. So it's like until that culture shift happens. But it's generational. We get it, we grow up with it, and then we, we keep passing it down, this interest. I I understand, yeah. Um, but right now, if you see the hashtags at this point, it's Pray for Venezuela, SOS Venezuela. Everything is about Venezuela. Even big artists are on, in this movement. I don't know why magazines don't, you know, um, just put a little a, a section like for hope or things that are going inside the world and artists that are supporting because we as you know we're the young people and we like this type of movement but you know it, if, it's happening online and that's where the story is being told yeah that's yeah. On, online it's 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 where, where it's happening you know uh, and, and I'm, I'm gonna actually it's hard put, to retweets everything like you can see it you know yeah. it's happening I'm gonna I'm gonna put everybody on the spot and I want everybody to be honest here how many of you would say with an upraised hand you don't really know what the situation in Venezuela is right now. Unfortunately, that's the reality. And so you might not see people click on Venezuela because three quarters of of this class doesn't know what that is. I agree with you. And I agree that it's, it's egregious that everybody doesn't know that. But the bottom line is that's what we have to answer to our stockholders, frankly. And that's where it's at. And if I'm being completely honest, I don't see us putting a Venezuela section because I don't... Now, granted, we are a celebrity news. You know, we're, you're, you know I'm not CNN. But I think what you would find out is that, um, you know, we put on our front pages what people... Are, what's trending, and and unfortunately, right now, it's not trending other than on some on social media, and I'm sorry about that. But but I, I think he he has a really good point, and I think that the problem is America and the American public is not the the place for this. Now there are um, British. Um, you know, papers and stuff like The Guardian is really good at reporting on human rights issues and actually sending out camera crews and things like that. So uh, looking from an international perspective, if I wanted to get some publicity for this and more people to know, yeah, I wouldn't worry. I'd say I don't worry about what the American public wants right now. There's tons of of European news outlets and and other places around Australia, maybe although Australia is really similar to America in terms of of how they interact culturally. But uh, yeah, I would go for somewhere like maybe the UK Guardian or tr- get the markets that you can. Don't don't get the, the publicity that you can't. Don't even waste your time with it. Go where you can and grow from there. 